looks very nice. <laughs> Yes, that's the secretary. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome uh, all of you, especially our online panelists uh, from the great IGF Summit from Addis Abeba. Uh, my name is Piotr Damczewski, and I represent the organizer of the panel, uh, Polish Competition and Consumer Protection Office. I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Martina Dersniak, who will moderate the panel.
very nice to be uh, there in person in Ethiopia. And uh, I imagine my colleagues, uh, Piotr and Eva, are having a really good time there. And I'm hoping the event is very successful. I attended it last year and it was it was really a great pleasure to be there. Um, Piotr has been, is, has been there presenting a very interesting uh, AI tool on, on consumer protection, which is obviously the, the field and the uh, area of expertise of all of us here. Um, and uh, this is particularly um, interesting to be able to have that panel here because uh, we, um, uh, all, all the experts and professional in, professionals in consumer protection that are here with us are um, consumer protection professionals, but there is a lot of challenge, lots of challenges that we tackle, which are related to dig digitalizations and, and dark pattern, dark, dark patterns is, is one such area. Uh, so uh, we thought that this is uh, it is very relevant to um, um, to discuss this topic of, uh, at the IGF Internet Governance Forum because we believe that there is a um, it's a it's a gathering of internet professionals and uh, and people who can um, who who tackle issues related to digitalization from a different perspective than us and uh, we thought it would be particularly interesting to um, to see how uh, we can alert and perhaps discuss and, and hear your thoughts on on this issue um, of dark patterns uh, which we struggle with and it's one of the most um, relevant and hot topics in consumer protection these days um, so i will not tell you what dark patterns are yet unless you don't know if you don't know it but i'm sure panelists will will start uh, will, will soon um, explain this uh, to you uh, but even if you don't know the term i'm sure you came across them many times um, maybe to some extent more or less aware depending on your background and depending on on how conscious a consumer you are on the internet um but i will not uh, make this any longer. I will uh, let all the panelists introduce themselves, just, just uh, stating your um, position and your background. And I will just just um, um, give, you, give you the floor based on the uh, random, um, random uh, order in our registration at the, of the session. So uh, Katarzyna Kasia, my colleague from the office, go ahead first. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, my name is Katarzyna Raczewska. Uh, I'm a deputy director in the Consumer Protection Department in the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection. And uh, almost from the beginning, I worked in the consumer rights enforcement in telecommunication and e-commerce sectors. And I also have some experience in legislative processes. So it gives me uh, an ability to look at dark patterns from two different perspectives. Thank you, Dries. This eraser. Yeah, thank you very much, Martina. And indeed, um, I'm using an alias today, which was not really intended, um, but sort of an emergency login. Anyway, uh, most people know me indeed as Dries Skype, as I work for the Authority for Consumers and Markets in the Netherlands. Um, I have about 20 years of experience in enforcement, of which um, over five years in the digital economy, and I have been very active in the field of dark patterns or deceptive design. Um, I am one of the co-authors of the Guidelines for the Protection of Online Consumers by the ACM, which basically, basically deals with dark patterns. Um, I will post the link later on in the chat. I think that's it for now. Thank you very much for organising this session. Thank you, Dries. Um, Egelin, would you go next? Thank you so much. Uh, so hello everyone. My name is Egalyn Brown. Uh, I'm a legal officer uh, working at the European Commission. Uh, I'm also team leader for the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, which is one of the key EU law instruments that uh, would apply to dark patterns as well as many other digital um, topics. Uh, in my day-to-day -day work, I, I focus mainly on digital issues. Uh, and I'm currently coordinating a, a review of EU consumer legislation precisely from this digital perspective. In terms of dark patterns, uh, it's also something on our radar. I helped uh, co-author the guidelines that the Commission uh, presented on the interpretation of the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, which also includes a section on dark patterns, as well as uh, our study uh, that we conducted uh, earlier this year, uh, which examined some of the effects of dark patterns, and uh, I will refer to it later on. Thank you. Thanks, Eglin. Uh, Nicholas? 
Yeah, good morning, everyone. And I'm grateful to participate in this panel today at this uh, great event, and I'm sorry to be not be there in person. Um, so my name is uh, Nicholas McSpedden brown I'm a policy analyst at the OECD, supporting the uh, OECD Committee on Consumer Policy, uh, which is currently doing a lot of work on, on dark patterns. And uh, today I'm Glad to be able to speak in particular about uh, about dark patterns uh, based on a report that the committee published last month, uh, available on the OECD website, which uh, discusses what dark patterns are, their their prevalence on ha uh, online, their harms, uh, and possible uh, responses to them from policymakers, regulators, and businesses. And so, <clears throat> so this is a quite a quite a wide ranging report and. Uh, and the Committee on Consumer Policy is now building on that report with some uh, empirical work to, uh, to further develop the evidence base on some key uh, dark patterns of interest. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Nicholas. Uh, Yoasha? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here with all of you, um, although virtually. Um, my name is Yoasha Luzak. I'm a professor of private law at the University of Exeter in uh, the United Kingdom. And um, I do research on consumer law, consumer behavior. A lot of my research focuses on information provision to consumers and transparency. And since um, lack of transparency, it really what leads to deceptive design and dark patterns. Uh, I'm very happy to discuss um, this topic with you today. Thanks very much. And last but not least, Leon. Good morning, everybody. Although here it's all good morning. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to be uh, be on this uh, on this panel. Uh, I represent uh, e-commerce Europe, uh, uh, the umbrella organization of uh, national uh, e-commerce uh, uh, organizations representing web shops. Uh, uh, we represent over 150,000 web shops all over Europe. Uh, and I'm I'm already in the, the, in consumer law since the late uh, late 80s uh, of the last decennia. Uh, and since 15 years, I'm working for in the e-commerce e e sector. Uh, I'm taking part in the Consumer Policy Advisory Group, which is momentarily busy with uh, with considering uh, the refit of uh, of European consumer law. And in that perspective, uh, we also uh, have as a subject uh, dark patterns and the question in how far uh, dark patterns uh, need to, need new regulation. So uh, I'm I'm involved in in the issue uh, from the beginning. I guess we also. Uh, uh, have uh, negotiations or talks with uh, with Bayuk, uh, uh, the European uh, Umbrella Consumer or the, the Organization on this issue, and as a business, we try to uh, to contribute to uh, a good understanding of uh, of what we mean with uh, dark patterns. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So, um, as you see, we are all. Um consumer protection uh, um, professionals and and we all have something to do with with uh, dark patterns e-commerce things that are happening online to, to consumers um, we represent a wide range of uh, actors as you can see um, and uh, it would be very interesting to to engage into this topic with with everybody here online and on site if you have any questions just post them on chat we will see and, and hope we can answer them otherwise we can try to answer them online on the chat uh, so Dark commercial patterns. Um, let's start with uh, with uh, Nicholas, perhaps telling us what they are. Um, you mentioned the OECD report, which which was declassified last month, and it was a much awaited document. Uh, we uh, all, uh, many of us, contributed uh, to this report, and uh, it's. Uh, um, it's a very uh, comprehensive um, review of, of dark patterns, uh, what they are. So, so please try and explain uh, to us what, what they are. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Martinez, for the question. So um, I think for some time, there's certainly been a rough common understanding of dark patterns as being uh, practices commonly found in, user, in the user interface design of websites and apps that trick consumers into doing things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. Um, and over time, especially with a lot of academic research, the, 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 there's been a growing list of practices that fit that description, and they've been categorized into taxonomies to allow us to better, better classify, classify them. And so we have examples ranging from fake countdown timers on e-commerce websites or having to go through multiple steps to cancel a service or having additional charges added in the final 
uh, stage of the of the transaction. Um, so there's definitely many many examples of, uh, out there, um, but there's also been a number of uh, definitions out there, um, and the, but but still no to pr provided by different actors, but still no universally accepted definition, and that's partly because there are several challenges involved. Um, for example, not not all dark patterns influence the consumer in the same way. Some some dark patterns are clearly deceptive, but others involve uh, emotionally manipulative framing, which which can be quite subtle. Um, some practices might not be considered dark patterns for all consumers. Uh, and in addition, it's sometimes hard to draw the line between a dark pattern and other commonly accepted marketing practices, such as uh, just com common common psychological pricing tactics involving reducing the first digit of a price by one and raising the others to nine, for example, which can also be considered manipulative. So, so really drawing the line sometimes is really a hard thing. But and and the Committee on Consumer Policy uh, did, did went took account of these challenges and and actually took inspiration from some of the the legislative text that has been developed in some jurisdictions trying to to define dark patterns and and actually in the report managed to develop a working definition to facilitate discussion among regulators uh, and policymakers across jurisdictions and so and I'll just I'll just explain how they've defined it. And so find as a business practice is employing elements of digital choice architecture, in particular in online user interfaces that subvert or impair consumer autonomy, decision making or choice. And it goes on to say that they often deceive, coerce or manipulate consumers and are likely to cause direct or indirect consumer detriment in various ways. Though it may be difficult or impossible to measure such detriment in many in instances. So this is a really, uh, I think, important first step here in progressing towards a common understanding or, or, or indeed a, 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 a global definition. But, but it's important to keep in mind that this is a working definition, which may well need to be adapted for specific contexts, uh, such as regulatory ap application, uh, so as to more, more easily take action against such practices, but also provide a legal certainty to uh, businesses. Thanks very much, Nicola. So, so in fact, um, what we can understand is that there is lots of such practices. It's it's it, it, there is many many different types of them, and it's they they have a different range, so to say, of being manipulative and and causing harm or detriment to consumers, and um, which is why it's difficult to um, to provide a definition because there is just so many of them, and they have such a different type of impact. On consumers, and uh, it, in my view, it's also interesting to see how how can we define manipulation and what is manipulative, and also what is what is detriment. Are consumers aware of it? Is it a situation in which a consumer makes a choice based on dark patterns, and then immediately after they are um, they are regretting it, or they are not even aware that they uh, have done something that would be their detriment? So this is. This is all very interesting. Yoasha, could you perhaps uh, also say something from your perspective on, on dark patterns, what they are, and why do you think they appear in the first place? Yes, of course. Um, so I think following up with Nicholas' um, definition that OECD uh, provided, um, I think it's quite interesting to note that the uncertainty as to what is a dark pattern or deceptive design and what is a relatively still inno innocent marketing practice, this, this distinction can be blurred. And I wanted to draw attention to the fact that Richard Taylor, who uh, coined the term of nudges, which is basically choice architecture, which we now have a problem with uh, for these deceptive design practices for dark patterns. So he differentiated um, the choice architecture, architecture nudges from um, what we call dark patterns by making a point that choice, choice architecture is neutral. So he says the choice architecture itself is never evil. It's how the designer of the choice architecture chooses to use it that leads to the issues that consumers experience with deceptive design. And um, that means, well, he calls these practices sludges instead of nudges, uh, which is quite interesting. And I think we need to also be very careful as to what terminology we use, because there's um, more and more, I think, comments appearing that dark patterns may not be the best term for these practices. So um, Taylor used the term sludges. Uh, Henry Bregnell is using the term now of deceptive design, and he's the one who actually originally came up with the term of dark patterns. Now, 
bring, bringing it back to the point, why do we have these practices on the market? If we look at the fact that the choice architecture itself is perceived as neutral, then its design would not be something that designers, uh, web designers, graphic designers would refrain from. It's just one of the tools to their disposal. Um, the same um, applies to advertising marketing companies. It's just one of the potential marketing techniques and tools. And then the question arises, how is this technology, these um, this, this design practice, uh, practices, techniques actually being used in practice? And this brings us back to the intent. Now, the problem with intent of the designer or of the trader is that if we only penalize such harmful digital choice architecture that was intentionally implemented to introduce harm, that would put a very high burden of proof on consumers and consumer organizations who protect collective interests of consumers. So we could, on that basis, argue against looking at the intent. But then the question brings us back to, okay, so how do we then determine these um, deceptive design practices and how do we actually dis differentiate them from um, the other practices on the market? How do we decide what do we prohibit and what do we focus our enforcement um, efforts on? And I wonder whether this actually should mean that we should focus on defining deceptive design or whether we simply need to know more clearly what categories of deceptive design there are and which should be fully prohibited because they have um, this potential of causing harm in any and all circumstances. So we cannot excuse them and which categories then actually require case-by-case -case assessment but that could happen on the basis of tests we already have which i'm sure we're going to discuss on the basis of the protection against unfair commercial practices so i this is just a beginning of a discussion for Barbara, i think uh panelists thanks very much and it, it, it was a very nice overview um it seems uh, in a way that uh, um, dark patterns or those kind of deceptive practices are, are like a slippery slope because we have many, uh, we have uh, online um, design architecture, choice, uh, choice architecture, and, uh, and it becomes kind of a slippery slope in the way that it's being used. Perhaps this is one way that it could be understood. So it was a very nice overview based on research um, in, um, at the OECD, among others, and, and academia. Thanks very much for this. I think that's already clarifying a lot. Um, now I would like to turn to, um, uh, to uh, our representatives of the enforcers of consumer law, um, Dries and, and Kasia, uh, and perhaps Eglin also. Uh, to tell us uh, a little bit from your perspective um, of standing at the uh, guard of uh, consumers, uh, why are they, um, why, why are dark patterns problematic? Uh, and uh, perhaps I would start with trees. Yes, thank you very much, Martina. And I think already there's a lot to unpack that has been said um, that I won't uh, go into immediately in terms of intent for example, and design being neutral or not, but but but, but let's stick to the question that you um, that you raised. So I, I think it's important maybe to before I dive into the more theoretical to sort of um, showcase what we're actually talking about. So there's a couple of cases that we have recently done, uh, some of which together with other European enforcement agencies that had some clear data patterns in them, and I think there's two ones that I want to single out just to illustrate what we're talking about in practice. Um, the first one is a case that we did against Amazon, where Amazon made it extremely difficult for consumers to cancel their subscription to Amazon Prime. So, um, whereas I think you would need about 43 clicks to get rid of Amazon Prime prior to the action, um, we actually told Amazon that they needed to reduce that number of steps to two or three which I think is, is a very clear dark pattern. I mean, we haven't investigated this, but there is some interesting um, journalistic reporting out there which, which suggested that this was a very deliberate attempt on Amazon's side to, uh, to retain customers. Um, and I think it has become a lot easier now for consumers to cancel their subscription if they no longer need it. So I think that's a very clear example of what we're talking about. Another one that I want to mention is a, a Dutch-based business uh, by the name of Booking.com, which I think is known to many people um, who, who do their bookings uh, online. 
Um, and they used to um, uh, use scarcity claims in relation to the numbers of rooms available in hotels that you were looking at. Now, the information that they provided can, of course, be very useful to consumers, if only it's true. So it might be very relevant for you that only two or three rooms have been left in the hotel that you're looking at. However, the thing was that the, um, the, the, the scarcity message that you received as a consumer, which said only two rooms left, may actually refer not to the period that you're looking um, into hiring a room, or um, it may actually not even be true. Um, so we clearly demanded from, uh, from booking to change this and, and to bring this in, in accordance with reality. So uh, where the information provided by the trader really becomes useful to consumers and no longer puts pressure on them to actually book a room as quickly as possible and therefore probably you know, be less critical of and, and, and do less research whether this is actually the best uh, available option for you. So I think maybe then um, going to the question on why are dark patterns harmful? And I think it's important to maybe distinguish a couple of types of harms of dark patterns. And I think the one that springs to mind probably the most is the individual harm. So that may be monetary losses in terms of not having the best deal. Uh, it could also be, for example, time lost during the process. Um, think about the Amazon Prime where you want to cancel and it takes you a long time to do so. Um, but also, for example, privacy lost in terms of, um, you know, the manipulative consent um, when we're talking about particularly the European setting of the GDPR. Um, I think the other problem is that we know that um, dark patterns may have negative effects on competition. So it could indeed trigger a race to the bottom where actually the business that is best able to manipulate consumers is best able to um, elaborate its market share and therefore be the winning competitor, which is, of course, not something that we would like to see in the market. And I think thirdly, and we, we know fairly little about this still, is that, um, you know, on the long term, on the long run, dark patterns may be able to impact uh, autonomous decision making by, by people, by consumers. Um, which is, um, I would say, something which is very undesirable um, and that we do not want to see. So um, here I'm thinking um, on what to add. I, I think there's there's a couple of quick things I, I want to mention. So I think I agree that some diet patterns are more harmful than others. We're still in the process of trying to find out which ones are more harmful than others. There is some good work out there, some, some both academic work, but also work, for example, that I want to refer to by our colleagues from the UK, from the CMA, who have tried to um, uh, bring an overview of all the different dark patterns and, and weigh their harms um, based on the, on the uh, available empirical research out there, which I think is very useful. Um, I think we also know that some dark patterns, for example, obstruction or forced action or the use of deep defaults may be, may be stronger dark patterns than others because we know that the biases that they play on are very strong. But I think it's very important to bear in mind that um, the specific application of a dark pattern may to a large degree determine the harm involved. Um, I think the sales channel that is being used, whether it's a website, app, or, or maybe in a game, is very relevant. Also the consumer that is being addressed particularly if dark patterns are start to be personalized, which is not unthinkable, uh, but also the product or the service involved may determine the effect of the dark pattern and also the, the extent to which there are uh, accu the accumulative effects of multiple dark patterns on a website uh, come into play. So that's, I think, why we as enforcers say that we think it's very important that there is a duty on businesses in general to create fair designs. And we think the way to do that is to also oblige them to test the effects on consumers of dark patterns, not just the effects in terms of conversion, which is something that's being done widely, um, but also to see how do these practices impact consumer decision making. And if it leads to the wrong decisions by consumers, then you would really have to wonder whether, whether this is a marketing practice that you want to engage in as a business. So I think I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Thanks very much. So in a way, I think that clarifies and uh, in another way, I think it shows how um, complex this topic is. 
Uh, Kasia, would you like to add something from your perspective? Um, yes, sure. Um, I fully agree that, that there is a variety of different dark patterns and in consequence they pose different challenges when combating them. And I think that um, we should have two factors uh, uh, in mind when we're think thinking about uh, creating a strategy to combat uh, uh, dark patterns. Uh, the first factor is whether we are actually aware we're facing a dark pattern, because it's very difficult to combat something we are not aware of. Uh, and the second one, whether we actually have at hand an adequate legal, legal grounds. Um, some dark patterns are relatively easy for consumers to spot, like drip pricing, for example. Uh, there is a big chance that uh, that consumers will notice the change in the final price. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that there is no consumer harm, because even in the best case scenario, uh, consumers lose time and they have difficulties to choose the best offer. And in the worst case scenario, of course, there are monetary losses as well. Uh, uh, but in other cases, uh, consumers might not even be aware there is a dark pattern there. And even if they can spot the mechanism on the on the interface, it not necessarily means uh, they can prevent it. For example, in 2019, we issued a decision against uh, SKPL. It was an airline intermediary uh, which offered insurance as pre-selected pre options. And in this case, of course, it resulted in repricing because it appeared only at the end of the purchase process, but consumers could uncheck the box so they could prevent the, the result of the, of the dark pattern. Uh, of course, not everyone noticed the box, which which is also uh, uh, which is also important in this case, uh, but it but it allowed allowed us um, some space for discussion with uh, with the trader and to issue a commitment decision. And for example, this year uh, we had a similar problem with Vinted Platform. It's a platform for uh, second hand uh, uh, clothing, and in this case there was a, a, an additional fee, a buyer protection fee, but uh, there was no checkbox that consumer could unbox and uh, it wasn't clear for the consumers to how to buy without the, the fee. So it seemed to them that the fee would be mandatory. And the harm in this case is uh, slightly different because it, it can affect consumers in a more serious way. And also we should bear in mind that in some cases uh, uh, consumers don't, don't see the dark pattern. They, Sometimes they see the consequences, for example, in subscription traps. Uh, in such cases, we, we receive uh, a lot of complaints, uh, but it is quite difficult to investigate it uh, since we don't know where the subscription trap may originate. And um, last year we issued a decision. It, it was also a commitment decision against Orange. It's an internet service provider. Um, concerning a subscription trap, uh, which was activated via uh, a flash SMS. It's a sort of a, a noti notification. It seems like a notification, but it's an SMS. However, it's not stored in the mailbox. So uh, consumers thought it was just uh, a sort of a spam. They they clicked it there. There were two buttons, OK and cancel, and they didn't even remember it. So uh, uh, only information they could provide us with uh, were concerning uh, consequences of, of the subscription trap because they couldn't uh, remember even seeing the notification, clicking on it. Uh, uh, and it also poses some, poses some challenges because if we don't have enough information in the complaints we receive, it's very difficult to investigate. We cannot use uh, sweeps, for example, to find such practices because uh, it doesn't affect everyone. So it's not enough to to enter on a website to to see whether it's it's all right. Sometimes there are more factors involved, and uh, then it also leaves us cases uh, where there is no visible consequences, not at the at the first sight. Like for example, when consumers see uh, recommendations that should be 
best for them, but not not necessarily are, and uh, to uh, to estimate the detriment in such cases, I think it's the biggest challenge, uh, especially that we don't always have uh, an adequate legislation at hand. I mean, UCPD directive is a, is a great tool, and I think it allows us to address many uh, uh, many challenges on the market, but uh, uh, not all of them, unfortunately. Thanks very much. So perhaps before we, um, we we finish talking about what dark patterns are in theory, in practice, uh, I would just ask Eglin to briefly um, present um, the, the work that the European Commission has done on the prevalence of dark patterns. Perhaps you could um, add something to what Dresen and Kasia have already said. Thank you. Uh, indeed, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, and I also pasted it now in the chat, earlier this year uh, we published the behavioral study on dark patterns because we at the Commission, in order to take additional policy action, we needed to get actual empirical evidence on how prevalent dark patterns are and do they actually impact consumer decisions. Because we hear a lot of uh, discussions about their potential to be harmful, but there aren't that many empirical studies that prove for each of the different types of dark patterns that we have talked about, what degree of impact do they have on consumers. So just very briefly, um, the findings are quite alarming, first of all dark patterns were considered to be highly prevalent. And here I'm talking about 97% uh, of the most popular websites and apps used by EU consumers contained at least one dark pattern. And most of them had uh, multiple dark patterns combined in one interface design. So that shows that there's a huge problem uh, of consumer manipulation. The most common dark patterns uh, were hidden information, creating false hierarchies, uh, pre-selections like the pre ticked boxes that Kasia was just mentioning, uh, nagging, so making repeated requests to consumers, as well as difficult cancellations um, in the style of what Reese was mentioning with uh, how many clicks it took to cancel uh, Amazon Prime. And so indeed, it appears, unfortunately, that dark patterns are universally prevalent right now. It's not just uh, that we are making fuss about uh, some kind of new hyped up term, but it really is a big issue. And in terms of how they actually impact consumers, then we conducted two behavioral experiments. Uh, the first one we had uh, with over 7,000 participants in six EU member states. And um, essentially we asked them to choose between two different packages of digital service. And we tried to manipulate their decision with dark patterns to choose one of them. And with that experiment, we proved that dark patterns did have a statistically significant impact on the transactional decision of an average consumer, so to speak, but also vulnerable consumers. And vulnerable consumers were more impacted, especially those who were older and those with a lower education level. So indeed, it is a problem and we have now some empirical evidence that uh, they do impact consumers. Interestingly enough, as a last remark, we also conducted a smaller experiment to see whether going beyond the economic harm or privacy harm that was mentioned that consumers can have, do they also suffer some neurophysiological uh, harms or some additional effects from being exposed to these dark patterns? And there we, we conducted this experiment with 120 participants in three EU member states, and the results were a bit more mixed. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, a type of forced action dark pattern, where you really um, strongly uh, encourage the consumer to take a specific decision, those did have the biggest impact. They increased the heart rate of the participants, which is associated with anxiety, with alertness, um, and uh, also, the participants reported the highest levels of frustration and feeling like they were being manipulated. So I think there's a lot of interesting research still to be done, which of course could help policymakers, but enforcement authorities. So indeed, I encourage you to read this study and to um, keep the research uh, going on these issues. Thank you. Thanks very much to, to all of you. And I think it's, it's very interesting to hear. So I think we have managed clearly to establish um, or perhaps, first of all, uh, clarify what, what dark patterns are, establish that there can be, there are different types of dark patterns, but there clearly are detrimental in the various ways to consumer, not just in terms of their economic losses, but also as you agree, have just described uh, in terms of even um, impact on their health. 
and uh, and uh, both in physical and, and um, psychological, they, they are manipulative and they should be isolated from a, a regular um, uh, legitimate um, marketing practices. Uh, so let's now focus on um, on uh, discussing how we can fight them and um, and uh, trying to see what different actors are responsible in uh, fighting dark patterns in addressing them. Um, and I think when we discuss this, there is the clear balance to see on, on what's the burden on different types of actor, actors um, in terms of um, businesses themselves and um, legislators and uh, enforcers of the law, of consumer protection law, uh, as well as uh, consumers themselves um, and to what extent they should be empowered or they should be equipped to, um, to, to defend themselves against those practices. So very briefly, uh, I would like to hear um, Nicholas and Tiyasha, uh, if you could tell us what is your perspective on that. And after this, we are going to ask Leon to share his perspective from the business practice. So Nicholas, perhaps you can go first. Yeah, thanks very much, Martina. And I just wanted to support what other panelists have said about the, the wide prevalence of dark patterns, the differing levels and types of harms mentioned and the vulnerability of certain consumers, and which is also thoroughly detailed in the uh, OECD uh, Committee on Consumer Policies report on the topic. Um, but more to your question, yes, indeed, there are many actors that, that need to be involved in addressing dark patterns. And so um, and as, as I think has been uh, mentioned a bit, the many dark patterns already fall foul of existing consumer and data protection laws in many jurisdictions. And so um, we've seen uh, consumer and data protection authorities playing, uh, well, they play, play a key role in enforcing those laws. And indeed, there's been a number of successful enforcement actions around the world, uh, including against major online platforms. And uh, Dries and Katarina have touched on some of the enforcement actions they've been uh, in, involved in. Um, but authorities can also contribute by providing guidance to business. And we've seen, again, around the world, various authorities providing guidance. Teresa and Eglin have mentioned some guidance provided uh, at the, in, the, in the European Union, uh, but also uh, in terms of raising awareness to consumers, um, along with consumer organizations as well. And there's been a number of consumer organizations playing an important role in educating uh, consumers about the dangers of dark patterns. Um, but, uh, and I think as, as Katarina slightly touched on, there may be gaps in existing laws. So not all dark patterns will not neatly fit within the scope of existing uh, consumer law. And so uh, policymakers here also have a, play, a role to play in plugging those gaps. And, and indeed, we've seen uh, many regulatory uh, proposals in recent years across jurisdictions uh, particularly relating to online platforms to try to address some of those some of those dark patterns that might be might not be able to be addressed within the scope of existing law. Um, other actors, uh, uh, important actors, are researchers. Uh, they play an important role in developing the evidence base uh, that acts uh, that, to support policy actions, including by, as we discussed, conducting more empirical studies to understand harms, but also developing tools to, to try to sort of detect dark patterns more easily. And there's been a lot of interesting developments in terms of the technology uh, around uh, sort of, for example, automatic scraping of, uh, of websites to try to find out where dark patterns are more prevalent. Um, and, and key actors, of course, are businesses, businesses, and especially user interface designers uh, that have a play a role in, in trying to, for in the first place, seeking to comply with existing uh, laws, but also developing uh, and abiding by fair marketing and uh, design standards, and um, and also trying to seek, try to find self ordered their choice architecture to make sure that they lead to good consumer out, uh, outcomes. And I think a final and a final actor here is also is consumers themselves. So consumers can play a good role, an important role in in, in learning about dark patterns and also uh, employing uh, tools, some tools that have been developed, such as uh, browser extensions or certain software that allows them to uh, detect uh, and mitigate dark patterns uh, on their own uh, as well. But I, I think it, the, the my main point is it's 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 a it's a com communal effort. It shouldn't, shouldn't be left to consumers their own. Each, each actors in the, in the system have an important role to play. Thanks very much. And uh, Yasha, perhaps you can also tell us a little bit more about this since you have described a lot on, um, on the background of how this have, has uh, 
come to be and, and how dark patterns have become so, so prevalent. Perhaps anything from the perspective of, of um, um, choice architecture, uh, what's, your, what's your take on this? Thank you, Martina. So I would support Nicholas' uh, statement that there is a huge role there for um, businesses, for traders to, to play as um, if you look at it from the perspective that they are the ones who decide how the choice architecture is going to be used and for what purposes. Um, having drawing their attention to ethical conduct, ethical business behavior, um, setting up these um, codes of conduct for different industries. I think that's really uh, the key point and they have the dominant role here to play. Additionally, what I wanted to mention is that while there is this incentive to say, let's just raise awareness of dark park patterns and deceptive design uh, of consumers and the issue will be solved. I think we need to remember that well, aside of the fact that it's not that easy to make um, consumers aware of what is deceptive online, there is the additional problem that even if we are aware of certain practices, behavioral studies show that due to various behavioral biases, FOMO-centric behavior especially, so that fear of missing out, we will likely still proceed with certain transactions that will not be in our best interest. And here, actually, I think this is a worth um, putting like a pin on it, because this is where I think our regulations also fail us at the moment. As for example, for unfair commercial practices, uh, protection to kick in, we need to prove that uh, consumers took a decision different as a result of that practice than they would have normally taken. So if we cannot prove that um, impact on consumer behavior, the protection will not apply. And if consumers would have proceeded with the particular transaction, regardless of that um, deceptive design, um, there is a problem. And the question is to what extent the application of the deceptive design causes additional harm maybe to consumers that wouldn't have applied previously, right? But it's a very small and slight distinction that will not actually be easy to apply in practice. So I think it's important to keep in mind that these behavioral biases will act really strongly here against consumers and they will often not be able to protect themselves, which is why we need to offer them that additional level of protection. Thanks very much. Okay, so the spotlight is on businesses now. Uh, and Leon, finally, perhaps you can tell us um, from the perspective of uh, e-commerce businesses, how aware you are of this problem and what do you think businesses can do to, to combat uh, dark patterns? Um, of course, first to tell, uh, we are also engaged in this uh, discussion, so we are uh, getting more and more aware of uh, of uh, of these practices of uh, of dark patterns. Although we have a problem with the definition of of dark patterns, uh, uh, dark dark uh, has a negative connotation, and and we want to differentiate uh, between uh, between those influencing uh, mechanisms uh, in, in 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 interface design, which uh, which cause harm. Uh, and which uh, which which are helping the consumer to make a good choice. Uh, uh, for instance, to give you an uh, the, 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 an example, there where where we want the consumer to make a more sustainable choice, uh, we give him the information on sustainability, and that might might bring him to another decision than he originally wanted. So so not all influencing is is in our uh, view is is dark or is is negative. Eh? So we editing we prefer. Uh, let me say a, a definition which uh, which differentiates between uh, sludges and uh, and nudges, eh? uh, because nudging for the good uh, uh, that is well accepted. And of course, we know uh, as uh, as uh, as businesses that uh, that consumers uh, sometimes uh, make decisions uh, they are which are not very rational. Eh? Uh, they are. Uh, the, uh, I think behavioral studies uh, show us that that all kind of mechanisms influence uh, the consumer's choice, and we think uh, that uh, uh, basically it's allowed to use this uh, this insights to to let me say to to help the consumer to make a choice. But but uh, in in our view, uh, uh, the border is the limit is there where it. Uh, uh, starts to cause harm to consumers where it is deceptive, uh, where it is uh, 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 where it's using in an improper way, uh, in an unfair way, uh, uh, missing out feelings and etc. Et and and we are now starting to 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 discuss and and to get 
get a knowledge and insight on on what is considered as as let me say unfair nurturing and, and what is considered as a, as fair nurturing and allowed to nurturing as a business we also have a need to know this differentiation because we want to be fair and right? most businesses want to treat uh, their customers in a fair way although some don't uh, and when i look to the examples which are brought up by by Dries and katarina it's clear that the these these practices are not uh, not very fair uh, uh, and 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 also let me say the major part of businesses agrees that that this is not desirable uh, behavior of uh, of web shops uh, uh, but we also see but 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 we also see that that most of most of uh, what what is called dark patterns unfair influencing is uh, is already covered by uh, by existing uh, uh, by existing law especially the, UN, the, the the unfair commercial practices directives in in Europe or similar uh, 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 legal acts in other jurisdictions uh, and what we also see what we also see which 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 we think is especially for online shopping is uh, is the case that uh, that consumers always have a right to withdraw in most cases they can withdraw uh, and they can refrain from the choice if they feel afterwards they feel uh, deceived or let me say uh, 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 not 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 handled fair and what we also see in Europe which we think is also uh, uh, in some way helping the consumer to make a, a, a good choice is uh, is the buy button uh, we have in Europe uh, saying to the consumer if you now push the button uh, or you click the button you are entering a, a paid contract and and it has a consequence for you and and it makes the consumer also aware of I don't think that uh, this is enough uh, but I think we can when we look at uh, thoroughly to the issue uh, we can find some some let me say uh, dark patterns uh, which are not covered by uh, by uh, by legislation we have now and we have to look very carefully which gaps there are which legal gaps there are and uh, and don't rush into let me say uh, uh, new legislation which is already covered by the existing legislation but which is not enforced uh, because i think there's also a a, a big role for uh, one consumer consciousness and secondly for for enforcement eh? and and maybe in enforcement i heard uh, some people say how do we uh, how do we recognize dark patterns uh, maybe mystery shopping is uh, is an is an excellent way uh, to try to uh, to find out uh, what dark patterns are actually or what nudging is actually uh, uh, on the market and is used by businesses and, uh, and which are unfair and which are not unfair. Thanks very much, uh, Leon. So I think this brings us back to the to the issue that um, it seems that definition of dark patterns is very important uh, and definition helps us classify some um, practices as um, detrimental and, and forbidden band um, uh, and others um, as uh, allowed and um, as part of fair marketing practices um, or even being innovative for consumers because this is also something that we should differentiate so uh, we have 10 minutes left and um, in those 10 minutes i would like to that we address uh, two more issues um, first of all uh, um, the issue on legislations um, since legislation should be fit for purpose uh, in terms of fighting dark patterns, being able to not not be not be too um, so to say fragmented or too uh, um, too um, too complex, so that it's clear and it's clear for businesses what is allowed, what is not allowed. Uh, that will be a question to Eglin whether you think that the legislation is uh, is uh, appropriate, whether there should be something changed. And uh, very briefly, please. And then uh, we will. Uh, I will ask also. Um, um, Dries, uh, to to say what you think on about uh, um, the the burden uh, of or once we establish the, the the issue of legislation, whether it is up to the um, consumer protection agencies to um, to um, protect consumers and to what extent uh, consumers themselves should be uh, able to protect themselves. But please, Eglin, first tell us about what you think on, on the current state of the legislations. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, 
law is uh, very important here. It's uh, essentially the tool that helps you to determine whether a practice is unfair or not. It's not only the behavioral experiments or the opinions that we may have on whether something is good or bad. And we've already heard uh, it mentioned uh, a lot uh, during this uh, panel discussion. So the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, uh, which is the main EU legal instrument that uh, covers all business to consumer commercial practices that may happen before, after or during the consumer's transactional decision. So in essence, indeed, as also others have mentioned, the test is to see whether the practice you have leads the consumer to take a decision that they would not have taken otherwise. And um, I also heard earlier this mention of intention as a possible element and to how we define dark patterns. So currently in EU legislation with this unfair commercial practices directive, intention to manipulate is not a necessary precondition. And personally, I think that's, uh, that's important to maintain. Um, because indeed it could also be due to negligence or due to a combination of different elements why in the end a certain interface design or commercial practice is considered harmful. So we elaborated more on how exactly the current legis legislative framework applies in uh, guidelines that the Commission uh, adopted at the end of last year. Uh, but just to give you a very quick overview of what could be the current rules that apply. So indeed, under this directive, uh, a dark pattern could be contrary to the trader's professional diligence. So this means the general standard that is expected from them when they design their interfaces. It could amount to a misleading practice. So by providing false information or truthful information, presented in a misleading way, or it could be hiding information, things like that. Or it could even be an aggressive practice, uh, which goes even further in impacting consumers by exercising undue influence over them or exploiting some of the known vulnerabilities that the company knows about. And there are also specific kinds of dark patterns that are already prohibited in the so-called blacklist uh, annex to this directive, like bait and switch practices, fake urgency cues, like fake countdown timers, for instance, or providing false information on market conditions, product availability, presenting false prizes that the consumer has not actually won, or presenting uh, free products that are not actually free, or also nagging, so creating these persistent and unwanted solicitations to the consumer. Um, looking a bit broader, as some of you may know, uh, in addition, of course, also to the data protection legislative framework, uh, especially in the recent year, the EU legislative framework has been strengthened. So we saw the adoption of uh, the so-called Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act, both of which contain some new provisions that do impact dark patterns. So in the Digital Services Act, there is now a definition of dark patterns that you can see in recital 51b, but also a prohibition of dark patterns when it comes to online platforms. But there is, of course, uh, also some nuances to it. So what exactly is covered? It carves out some practices that fall under the data protection regime, as well as the unfair commercial practices directive. Uh, looking now towards the future, we do have, let's say, these very broadly applicable laws, which can potentially cover any practice, any kind of dark pattern. We don't need a definition of dark patterns. It can just be an unfair commercial practice uh, is how we define it. But is there more that needs to be done? And this is precisely what the commission now is looking at. We have launched the so-called fitness check evaluation, looking at some of our key consumer legislation and trying to decide whether or not we need further amendments. And dark patterns is one of the key topics that we're looking at. For instance, do we need to prohibit new kinds of dark patterns that are currently not prohibited, like uh, Leon uh, mentioned. Uh, so identifying where are really the gaps. Uh, do we need additional new obligations like a fairness by design principle or a fair or neutral design obligation uh, for companies and things like that. So this question is still open. We're currently conducting a public consultation and let's see in, in one and a half years when the fitness check concludes, what will be the opinion of the European Commission on this matter? Thanks very much, Eglin. So final question uh, to Dries. Uh, 
we uh, there is uh, also uh, I I see um, a lot of exchanges on chat about this on uh, empowering consumers and and uh, simply uh, uh, to what extent would it be a solution to simply uh, make consumers aware and uh, equip them with knowledge about dark patterns and and leave it to them to um, to uh, uh, protect themselves against them. Yeah, thank you very much, Martina. And I want to seize the opportunity to address really two things. I think one is legislation and the other one indeed is can we educate consumers? Um, maybe to start with um, legislation, I think one thing is important is to mention that we are really up against a very big shift that needs to take place in the business community. I think I'm certainly not accusing all businesses, I think as Leon rightly so mentioned, of doing this deliberately, although some do, we have to acknowledge. I think generally the problem is that many that there is a lack of, of awareness or compliance in the business community as a result of too strong a focus on uh, increasing conversion or sales or turnover. So I think generally what we need to do is we need to get this shift going. And I, I agree with Nicholas and what he said echoing that this is really a communal effort that everybody needs to be involved. But I think squarely responsibility needs to be on the business community be in the first place. And I think that's that's a very relevant notion from my uh, side. Um, I agree with um, Eglin that we need to be very careful to introduce intent. It will make it extremely hard to, to prove uh, dark patterns or violations of the law, uh, as we know from criminal law. Um, and, and I think most uh, enforcement agencies around the world that are responsible for these kinds of legislations do not have criminal powers, so it would be making matters extremely difficult. Um, I think also we shouldn't sit still in terms of legislating until we know everything. I mean, re the call for research, yes, I fully support, but um, we should not wait uh, with legislating until we know everything um, about this. So. Um, then the other thing, uh, I just want to mention it, not a lot of time to go into detail, but I disagree that uh, design can be neutral. I don't think design is ever neutral. Um, and it's just a matter of deciding or actually investigating the effects of design and then deciding whether the effects are desirable or not. Um, then maybe maybe moving to the, to the consumer side. So I think we should always try and educate consumers. But I think I want to have a couple of notions of caution here. First of all, and I think this was already mentioned by several people on the, on the, um, on the panel, very often dark patterns cannot be and will not be recognised by consumers, not even if you educate them. And also the sheer nature of dark patterns is that they play on our subconsciousness. So even being aware of a dark pattern does not mean that you're not susceptible to it. So that's why I'm highly skeptical, skeptical of, of finding a solution per se with educated consumers. Secondly, I think it was mentioned rightly, so they're not the cause of the problem, so they should also not be the solution to the problem. Um, so I, I think that's some very important notions. Um, Though that I want to to mention around um, consumer education in relation to dark patterns. Um, so do we need different legislation? Yes, I think we do. Do we need some? Uh, can we use speaking about the European system? Can we use the current legislation? Yes, absolutely, to to a large degree. Um, but I also think we do need um, uh, specific prohibitions. Um, to make it clear what is allowed and what is not allowed, both to consumers, but also to business community. So I think they also benefit from clear legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are exactly 11 o'clock. So um, this is the end of this panel. Uh, and uh, it's not the end of the discussion, of course. Uh, it's, uh, it only shows, I think I, we, we, we managed to perhaps put on the table all the issues that, um, that are at stake here. Uh, I hope, and to make um, make everybody aware of uh, the complexity of the issue. Uh, and uh, we will continue talking about this. Uh, if you are interested, reach out to us. And I see there is a, also some exchange on the chat. The Eglin has posted a link to the um, fitness check uh, on digital fairness uh, uh, of the European Commission. Uh, and um, 
I uh, thank you all for um, being here and for the for this sharing your views and your opinions and even even to us I think it was to us who 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 work with those issues on a daily basis it was very interesting to hear each other's views and uh, let's keep in touch uh, and I wish uh, um, very good time in Ethiopia to all the participants of the uh, Internet Governance Forum. Um, and reach out to us if you're interested in anything. Thanks very much and thank you to everybody. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.